How to lower blood pressure by breathing. Over a billion people in the world have high blood pressure and you can actually lower it by breathing. But the question is, how does that work? How do you do it correctly? And most importantly, how do you do it in such a way that you get long lasting results? Today we're going to cover seven different concepts, seven principles so that you really understand everything about breathing and once you truly get the bigger picture then you can not only lower your blood pressure but you could literally transform your life. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So just a real quick review on what blood pressure is. Blood pressure is the pressure that results from the heart contracting against the peripheral resistance, against the resistance from your blood vessels out in the body. If you didn't have your heart contract and if you didn't have your vasculature resist, there would be no blood pressure. Dead people have no blood pressure. So the key there to understand is that blood pressure doesn't happen to you. Blood pressure is created with every beat of your heart. The moment your heart stops beating, you have no blood pressure. Normal blood pressure depends on the situation. So resting blood pressure for someone who is upright should be around 120 over 80. If you're laying down, it should be less because blood flows easier when it doesn't have to overcome gravity. But on the other hand, if you're exercising, you are putting a tremendous demand on your body. You're increasing the demand of blood flow and nutrient delivery. So you have to increase your heart rate. You have to increase your blood pressure. It's appropriate when you're exercising. So during intense exercise, you could actually have 220 in blood pressure and that is normal. So blood pressure is created and it is dependent on the situation. The second thing to understand is that exercise is a form of stress. Stress increases the demand on the body. And when we have stress, it's a matter of balance between what's called your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. So those are big words. What does that mean? They're also known as fight-flight. Sympathetic is fight-flight and parasympathetic is known as feed, breed, or rest, digest. And what these are, it is your autonomic nervous system, the automatic portion of your nervous system, the part that handles everything that you don't have to think about. It is a resource allocation system, okay? Blood delivers resources and your autonomic nervous system decides where the blood goes. So when you're exercising, then most of the blood should go to the muscles because that's where they're needed to perform the work. So your fight-flight system, your sympathetic nervous system, sends most of the blood out to the muscles. And then when you relax, hopefully, then your fight-flight, your sympathetic, can back off and allow your parasympathetic to get some of the blood and send it to your vital organs so that you can digest food and so that you can make immune cells and so that you can heal tissue. So you can have an anabolic function. So the key is to understand that these systems are like a seesaw. That whenever you, one system increases, the other decreases because there's only so much blood in the body and you can only send more in one direction at one time. So if you send more one way, you have to borrow from someplace else. So the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, the fight flight and the feed breed, it's like a seesaw. It's like you're driving a car. You can't speed up and slow down at the same time. You've got to pick one. And that's what the body does. It allocates the resources depending on the situation. So when you have stress, then it's going to increase your heart rate 
It's going to increase your blood pressure, it's going to increase your cortisol and your blood glucose and on and on and on. When you are relaxing, then resources are made available for your digestion, your immune system and your healing. So you can defend yourself, you can stress or you can heal. You just can't do both at the same time. You got to pick one. So number three thing to understand is that there are different types of stress. Exercise is physical stress, but we also have what most people talk about when they say stress is emotional stress. So in a sense, we could say that exercise is very appropriate stress, but emotional stress is sort of imaginary stress. It's not really a stress that demands a lot of physical exertion, but your nervous system responds that way just in case. It's going to increase your heart rate, your blood pressure, your blood glucose, your cortisol. Even if you're just sitting in traffic and cursing the gridlock and the traffic jam, when you're getting stressed, your body acts as if it's a physical stress just in case. And if we want to narrow down what emotional stress is in the simplest possible way, the simplest way to describe it is to say that emotional stress is thoughts about the unwanted. Whenever you're thinking about what you don't want, when you're focusing on something that's upsetting, when you're focusing on something that you'd like to be different, then you have emotional stress. And a lot of people will tell me that, well, you know, my life is great. I don't have emotional stress. I don't have any stress. But this is a habit. Most of the stress we're not even aware of because we've done it so much that it became a habit and we learn to live with it and we kind of just push it away and it becomes our norm. It becomes our default baseline. But we still have a lot of sympathetic activation. So that's the very basics that we need to understand why breathing is going to work. So now we get into the breathing and there's something called heart rate variability. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Your heart rate varies. So when you breathe in, your heart speeds up. When you breathe out, your heart slows down. And again, your body is just so incredibly intelligent. When you breathe in, there's more oxygen in the lungs. So the body speeds up the heart rate to send more blood there to pick up the oxygen because that's more efficient. Then you breathe out, there is less oxygen, so we slow down the heart rate so we're not wasting resources. When you are in harmony, when there is what's called coherence in your nervous system between your brain and your heart, then your heart rate variability is going to be coherent. It's going to form a smooth pattern like a sine wave. So if you measure your average heart rate at 65, then if you have a healthy heart rate variability, it means that when you breathe in, your heart rate is 70. When you breathe out, your heart rate is 60. And the average becomes 65, but it's always going up and down, up and down. And this turns out to be one of the best indicators of overall health that we know of. People who are supremely healthy, they have a fantastic, smooth and large heart rate variability. And people who are not so healthy, they have more what's called an incoherent pattern. So when we're frustrated, when we're angry, then there is no pattern. It's just jagged lines. The every heartbeat is sort of chaotic and mismatched. It's, it's all over the place. So this would be a very healthy pattern and this would be a very unhealthy pattern. And the great thing is that you can influence this. You can practice it and learn it and get it better. And the way to do that is to pay attention to your breathing pattern. Most people, if you don't tell them anything, you just tell them to kind of sit around and relax and you count their breaths, you observe their breaths, then most people are going to breathe in for about two seconds. So in one, two and out one. In one, two and out one. And that's about 20 breaths per minute. 
And even if they're reasonably relaxed, so it's not a terribly incoherent pattern, it's still going to be too fast a pattern. So if we're breathing 20 times per minute, it's not enough time for the body to relax. There's not enough time for the body to kick in the parasympathetic. So it's like we're getting breathing in and we get sympathetic, we start breathing out, but before we're done, it's breathe in and breathe in. So there's way, way, way too many breaths. So if we have sympathetic on the upscale and parasympathetic on the downscale here, then the breathing pattern would be all sympathetic. The red here would be all sympathetic because it's in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. It doesn't give the body time to relax and for the parasympathetic nervous system to engage. But if we slow the breath down, if we breathe in for four seconds and out for five seconds, we breathe approximately equal. We breathe slower overall. We breathe approximately equal, but a little bit longer on the out breath. Now we create balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's not that one is good and the other is bad. It's like everything else in the body. There needs to be balance. With this pattern, we can start practicing that balance. And the very first thing that happens when we start paying attention to our breathing pattern, when we slow our breath down and we pay attention to the in-breath and we pay attention to the out-breath, is we change our focus. And that may seem like a small thing, but it is one of the biggest things there is. And we'll try it in just a second here, but when you pay attention to your breath, you can no longer at the same time think about what's unwanted. Try it. If you're stressed, you're thinking about the kids or the deadline, and then you pay attention to your breath, then for just a fleeting moment, you didn't think about that other thing. And that is, like I said, may seem like a small thing, but that is an incredibly powerful principle that you're no longer doing that thing that keeps you in your state of emotional stress. And if you do enough of that, you can break the pattern. And now that we break the pattern, we need to understand what neuroplasticity is. So a lot of people, they say, oh yeah, I tried your breathing and it felt great. I did it three months ago. I tried it once and I did it for five minutes and I felt great. But the next day it was the same thing over. And they're not understanding the principle of neuroplasticity. They're not understanding the principle of habit and momentum. It, don't be like the person who says, oh, diets don't work. I ate a carrot once and nothing happened. All right? That's ridiculous. It's not about what we do once in a blue moon. It's about what we develop as a lifestyle. It's what becomes a pattern in our life. So neuroplasticity means that when you practice something, and it becomes a skill, when you practice it enough to become a skill, and then you maintain that skill, then you actually reconfigure the tissue in your brain. Your neural pathways become different. A neural pathway that you practice, that you use a lot, it becomes thicker. Think of it as walking across a lawn. If you just walk across a lawn once, then you bend the, the blades of grass and then immediately they stand up and it's like you never walked across. If you walk across a hundred times, now the grass is going to look a little flat and you can start discerning a pathway. And if you walk across a hundred times every day, then the grass is not going to be there. There's going to be a pathway. And that's exactly how it works in your nervous system, that the things you do more of become pathways. They become larger pathways. And if you do it enough, it becomes a super highway that has traffic on it, whether you think about it or not. This is exactly the principle that's in place when you're right-handed versus left-handed. 
Okay? You think someone tells you to, to write something down and you grab the pen in your preferred hand and you just start writing without thinking. But if they tell you to switch hands, all of a sudden you have no idea what to do. You have to focus intensely and it's going to go super slow and it's not going to be pretty. Why? Is it because you, you don't know how? No, you, you understand the mechanics but you haven't developed the skill. The pathway isn't there. The neuromotor patterns aren't developed. Another way of thinking about that is like a concert pianist. Just because you practice on a piano for five minutes doesn't mean you know how to play piano. But if you play a few hours every day for 20 years, all of a sudden you can play and have a conversation at the same time. You've developed so many pathways that it's going on automatic. That's what neuroplasticity is. Understand that stress is the same way. Your, hab your habit, your habitual way of focusing on things you don't want is a habit. Emotional stress is a habit and you can develop a skill you can develop a momentum that's the opposite of that habit and then that habit goes away. So what that means is it's going to be as good as what you put into it. And my recommendation would be to do it once or twice a day for five to ten minutes and I want you to do it until you notice results. And you'll start noticing results very very soon but if you stop then the habit goes away. So I would say set your goal to do it for at least six months because if you do it six months you're probably in the habit that you'll keep doing it forever. And once you have that kind of habit, once you have that pattern, chances are that you will even start breathing, you'll even get into that emotional state when you're not thinking about it. It becomes your norm regardless of where you are. You can do it in, in school, you can be that way in business meetings, in sales meetings, wherever you are with the kids screaming at you, you can still be that way. So the number seven principle to understand is that the benefits to this are endless. It may seem like I'm over promising but if you truly understand that you're sympathetic and you're parasympathetic, that is what your autonomic nervous system is. That is what your health is. That is the system that determines how you function. It determines everything about you. So if you do this on a regular basis, it's not just that your blood pressure goes down, you are rewiring all of you. So what you will find is that sure your blood pressure will go down but so will your cortisol and so will your insulin resistance and your circulation will improve so you all of a sudden you end up with warm hands your, your digestion will improve you will get more nutrients out of your food we spent all of our time talking about what to eat but how do we digest it well we digest it by activating our parasympathetic nervous system Immune function, you have fewer colds and flus, you heal better, even your fertility is a matter of sympathetic versus parasympathetic because you can't get pregnant when you're stressed. Your body says, hey, this is not a good place to get pregnant, we better wait till it's safe to have a kid. If you have sweaty hands, if you suffer from hyperhidrosis, whether it's sweating in the palm or under the arms, that's stress. If you activate, if you practice activating your parasympathetic nervous system, that will go away. How quickly? For some people it'll happen in a week, for some people it will take six months. So don't stop after a week. Because when you're doing this you're sending more blood to the frontal lobe and to the cortex of your brain, you'll also are probably going to notice that your focus gets better, your memory gets better and the list is endless. Pretty much anything you want you can put it on that list and if you get your sympathetic and parasympathetic in balance it's going to improve. So even though this is a video about how to lower blood pressure I want you to start looking at the bigger picture of holistic health that there aren't little sub-compartments of function. The nervous system, your body, your organism works as a whole. When you, when you truly improve an aspect by 
helping the foundation of it, you're automatically going to get a trickle-down effect that's going to improve multiple things. So now for the patient ones who are still sticking around or watching the whole thing because you're serious about your health and understanding, let's do a little breathing session. So you could do this to yourself, you don't have to count out loud, but here's just an example of how that would work. You count, breathe in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five, and in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five, and in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five, okay? Now, what you want to think about is it is a little bit deeper breath than a shallow breath, like a normal shallow breath that a lot of people have, but it's not filling your lungs to full capacity. It's not deep breathing. It's not panting. It is just a little bit deeper and you want to initiate, you want to breathe from your belly. So a good way of doing it is to put your hand on your belly and as you breathe in, you notice your hand rising, you notice your belly expanding. So the first part of the breath, your hand is rising, your belly is expanding and then that's the first half of the breath is that and then slowly and gently you allow the breath to rise into your rib cage and expand your, your lungs and your chest just a little bit and then you relax and just let it out very very slowly and if you breathe through your nose which I recommend then there should be no sound at no point should you breathe hard enough to make a sound it should be completely quiet both in and out and think of it as a sine wave, as valleys and peaks. And when you're breathing in at the top, there's going to be a moment where you don't notice. You're not sure if you're breathing in or out. It's just kind of like hanging there. And then you breathe out slowly and silently. And then at the bottom, there is a moment where you're not sure if you're breathing in or out and then all of a sudden the breath is just happening by itself again and again it's slow and silent. You don't want to start using your shoulders. You don't want to get into raising your shoulders when you breathe because that's a stress response. Okay? You're backfiring on, on your parasympathetic uh, activation if you raise your shoulders that this is a stress response. When we get attacked as part of fight-flight, we bring the shoulders up. That's why stress causes shoulder and, and neck stiffness. So keep your shoulders relaxed, breathe from the belly, allow the breath to rise very gently and slightly into the chest, and then out again. So let's try that just one more time. Breathe in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five, and in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five. Okay, so there's some tools, there's some toys on the market you can buy to help you breathe, so you can learn to breathe, so you can get some feedback if you're doing it right, but you don't need any expensive tools. If you want them, great, they can be fun to play with, but if you just pay attention, you'll get all the same benefits anyway. If you like this video, I'm sure you're gonna love that one. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.